Greetings again to everyone tuning into this and welcome to the second part of our extended interview with IP legend Professor Sir Robin Jacob. Uh, my name is Gordon Harris from the Gowling WRG IP leadership team. Welcome back Robin, great to have you here again. And last time we concentrated quite a lot on your judicial career and before we move on I'd just like to, to go back prior to that again and, and maybe ask you about some of the cases you were involved in as counsel. Um, cases you were particularly enjoyed or, or, you know, what do you think stood the test of time? I don't know. That I, 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 you asked me to think about it. I thought about that quite a bit. I don't know that any of my cases really stood the I suppose to clear the way is still mainly true, but even then some, some there's been a bit of backpedalling going on, I can see. Um, I don't know that any cases really stand the test of time. Um, uh, uh, you know, all the things that Hoffman laid down have all been torn up. Um, Indeed. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I'm not convinced that anything stays the same. Where, where, where did you stand on the whole um, Actavis thing? I mean, you know, the um, for many, many years we we shied away from from all of that, and then then in it comes um, into to the Supreme Court in the Actavis case. I mean, where where did where did you sit on that topic? Oh, I think they're completely wrong. We worked perfectly well without it. I ran that big event at UCL. It's the biggest event we had. Nearly nine hundred people come to it. I took a vote. Yeah. Quite clearly, most people. Thought, thought it was wrong decided. It hasn't done the law any good. It hasn't done. It hasn't done, done inventiveness any good. It's done nothing at all. And, and it's it, it, except that it, it's much harder, as you can tell me more than I can tell you. Much harder to advise. It is much harder to advise. It certainly has rendered things very, very difficult indeed. Especially and especially when when you follow the implications through from infringement into validity as well. The Americans have had it for years. Um, uh, the Graver Tank case. Yeah, could never have happened in Europe because you'd have just amended the patent to claim what the, the very substance. The trouble with that case, the merits were absolutely dead in the patentee's favour. Uh, the specific disclosure was there in the patent. Yeah, we could have allowed an amendment because there was a wider claim to do it, but they don't. You can't amend the patent in the United States. A big defect of the U.S. system. Um, uh, yeah. But we don't need it. And I mean, most people spend, have, it's a bit like um, the White Knight, but I was thinking of a plan to dye one's whiskers green and then on so large a fan that they could not be seen. You know, you, you, you do something daft and then you spend all your time up trying to undo it. Um, uh, and that's what the Americans have been doing and we'll have to do the same. Uh, and I don't think it's done any good at all. I think you may have just answered one of my other questions there, actually, because I was going to say your, your judgments were never anything less than entertaining to read, because there were lots of bon mots, lots of interesting little passages and quotes and throwaway lines. Do you, I was going to ask you whether that all came naturally or whether you had a kind of author's feel to this and sort of went back and perfected them. But I, I suspect you've just answered me by by in that last answer, but it probably just comes straight out, does it? Uh, some things do. Sometimes, you know, I, I, I look back, sometimes I, something I said in, in, in an off-the-cuff judgment um, were better than things I composed carefully. I, I work very hard on my judgments, actually. Um, and people are a bit surprised because they always thought I was a lazy soul. And, uh, I, I, and I, 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 one of the things I, di I did was to, uh, unless I was being lazy, was to not put in any detail that didn't matter. Why do I need to? Why do I need to say this? If I don't yeah. need to say it. I don't say it. My last judgment, the Court of Appeal, was five pages long. It had two points in it, uh, uh, and I, 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 I really think the world has gone mad in the length of judgments. Oh, unbelievable! And and sometimes I think that the judges are showing off their technical knowledge, and you get about two hundred paragraphs at the beginning of the judgments on the technology, with the judge demonstrating to the world that they've understood it, which is broadly unnecessary. Um, very unnecessary, not just the technology, I mean also citation of authorities. I mean, yeah. really. Uh, yeah. I, I once reproached, there was a chap called Binney in the Canadian Supreme Court. I said, why do you write so long? He was one of the first. There was, it was, it's, it's, we didn't do it so much here at that point. There was Binney in Canada and there was, um, oh, what's he called in Australia? Bill Gummo. Um, and uh, they wrote these things. They were just showing off how many cases they could cite. 
he said to me, well, I've got different audiences. And I said, what do you mean? Well, we've got the academics. I said, you know, you don't have to write for academics. Don't they you have to take up what you've got. You're not yeah. writing for them. Well, that's what footnotes are for, isn't it? You know, send the academics off happily to, to research. You don't need to set it all out in full. Yeah. <laughs> Just drifting back to Actavis, we, um, you know, we, I, I wrote an article on that saying we should have seen that coming because, of course, back, right back in 2001, in the first instance decision in Kieran Amgen, as it became, it changed its name throughout, um, Mr Justice Newberger, as he then was, made the first kind of finding of... Um, doctrinal equivalence and it was overturned twice once in the court of appeal and then in the house of lords resoundingly but um you know obviously he made his way up through the courts and got his own back it's a rather a lengthy revenge i think it took him 16 years but well, well i remember that i mean i mean he's always he, he, i think he's still doubtful now to really whether he didn't make a big blunder but, he said that well, i think they did I, 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 unfortunately um it was a non-specialist court. I know David did quite a lot of patents, but uh, uh, um, it was basically a non-specialist court. Um, uh, you know, if you've got a, you know, man who says I'll take sodium, can't have potassium. <laughs> yeah, well, indeed. So, just moving on a little bit to your current role. <coughs> so you you described well, in the well, first. I, 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 oh, the, fault, the fault came from the European Patent Office, who wouldn't let them amend, and their fault was That's right. by yeah, the absolutely. fact that they didn't come back with with a divisional, which they fought for it. Exactly. I mean, that that that, that skewed the whole, whole thing actually, and it yeah. also ended up with another thing. Just there was, there was a suggestion that the judgment would lead to far rapper estoppel, and in fact, what Lord Newberger was talking about was the polar opposite of far, far rapper estoppel. In that, in that case, he was, he was saying, I'm not bound by it, a mistake made by the by the European Patent Office. I'm prepared to move away from it. I'll, I'll look at it to, to find that it was wrong. So it's exactly the opposite of far rapper estoppel. But anyway, there we are. There we so are. The, coming on to your role now where you are at, at UCL, what do, you, what do you want to achieve? What do you want to look back on at the end of that phase and say this is what I've done in, the, in this role as professor at UCL? Well, I, 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 uh, I, I've tried to put UCL on the map. We've run, run some major conferences and things um, and I'm very fortunate. Most people, if I'm kind enough to come, if I ask them, uh, they know who it is who's asking them from around the world, which is very nice. Um, I, I don't know. None of it will be permanent. Uh, things aren't. Um, they come and they go. You know, the greatest test team Suddenly loses. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think UCL's been pretty consistently near, you know, quite high up in the in the um, in the legal rankings, certainly for many years. And that's, I think I think we're well positioned. I mean, uh, the, you know, the LSE is as well as my old university. Um, uh, it, sometimes I think academics can be too academic. Uh, I find myself as a bit of a stranger sometimes in what's being discussed at at UCL we have these sessions every now and then where I go to some of them where an academic presents what they're up to just for us internally um, sometimes I understand sometimes I don't I understand the commercial law ones I'm not sure I do understand I've never been a great fan of um, jurisprudence I think it's a no there's a language more, there's a language it. It, it, not, they use a lot of language you don't understand but I, I think deep, that deep down they're, they're grappling with, they're making the concepts much too complicated. And the rule of law is a basic straightforward rule. And you should, it's very pragmatic. It, 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 it's not a, a theoretical thing. It's what happens to judges when somebody's bringing pressure on them or tries to or, or, or doesn't. Or because it's well, not, a bit of that. It doesn't because it's not possible. It's a bit of that going on at the moment. Don't in, in his last few years, um, I, I was lucky enough to get to know uh, Lord Ashdown, Paddy Ashdown, and I had some quite nice long chats with him. And he was adamant that the rule of law was more important than anything else, and that when he was trying to re-establish Bosnia at the end of the, the Balkan Wars, establishing the rule of law was more important to him at that point than getting democratic institutions in place. You know, he said until democratic institutions won't survive if there isn't the rule of law to underpin them, and it's it's sort of it's it's that fundamental, isn't it? Really, is sort of yeah. 
Um, you've talked a bit about, you know, you know, you, judges you've known in Canada and Australia. And of course, you were well known for knowing all the European judges very well and had great relationships with some of them. You quoted them frequently, attended meetings with them. Do you think that level of European judicial collaboration will survive um, Brexit and our, our non-participation in the UPC? I don't see why it shouldn't. I mean, I, I, you know, I've, I've, had, I've had a WhatsApp this morning from my friend Robert Van Pearson, Advocate General to the Dutch Supreme Court, um, former patent judge. I, I've been in contact with, with, with Gus Bacher, who's going to come to an event I'm doing uh, in, in November, advert here, uh, on, on uh, Regeneron. Um, so, yeah, so still working. Well, I mean, together. it's fascinating. I can ask them, well, what do the Germans think of Regeneron? Uh, and Cato Manet is coming from the Federal Court of Appeal in the United States. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone would say, you know, intellectual property is a global phenomenon, and it's great if the judges are are interacting. I just wondered if there would be any kind of, you know, barriers going up. And obviously, your relationships predate all of this stuff. But I'm just wondering if, if maybe it might be a little more difficult for the young judges now to form those relationships when we are going to be out on a limb. Well, I think um, it may depend on the, on, on the IP subject. For example, we don't really do much in the way of copyright. We never have done. I don't, I don't really know the specialist judges on copyright. Um, Trademarks, I think that may be so. We, I mean, I was, you know, used to go to Alicante quite a bit and so on and meet judges there. And, and there was the European Patent Judges, the Trademark Judges Symposium, which used to run every two years in Alicante. Uh, and we won't be going to that. And I think that's a pity. Patents, on the other hand, divided we stay in the EPC, you, 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 then we've got the European Patent Com Academy, which is extremely well run. Um, and a very good institution that they've created there. I was skeptical at first. I said, why, why does the patent office need to create an academy? And the answer is because it's not just a patent office, it's actually a promoter of the patent system. Um, and it started really, you know, I mean, I first, my first experience was in 1994. I was, when the UK was the host, we all went off to Wales. Um, and I got to know some of these people uh, and we became friends over the years. And Hugh came and joined me by 1996, we had, 1998 I think was, 96 was Sweden, 98 was um, uh, Spain and we had a meeting there and the, the head of the Federal Patent Court was a lady called Sederman Triber and she said, Hayden and Triber, and she said, we've got to try and create a European patent court. And we'll create a, a group of people who call ourselves the Madrid group. It was pretty hopeless actually at the time. They didn't, most other judges didn't, didn't use email yet. I mean, we were way ahead. Of, uh, the electronic judgments had just started happening then. Um, but that was all done miles before any, uh, before this EPC project. And well, why can't it go back to that? And it will. We have the, we'll have the annual Venice meeting. I hope the European Patent Office may reinstate the biannual meeting of all judges, including judges from non-patent countries. They may not. It's quite expensive. Um, it used to be funded half by the EPO and half by the host country. Um, we used to have two judges, at least from every, every member state of the European Patent Convention. So you you were involved in you were involved in the judicial training, weren't you, for the UPC? Um, is that all still going on? Do you think there's a political will across Europe to to make the unitary unified patents court happen, even even without us? Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's a that's a that's a non legal question. It depends on yeah. It's it's it, it's not really political across Europe. It's a question whether Germany is going to do it. At the moment, it's still alive. Uh, yeah. The chap who's running it, Alexander Ramsey, is a uh, 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 a Swede, a brilliant judge and a brilliant man, in my opinion, and his very nice story. We had a, we were having a meeting of, uh, of the UPC committee and it was going to be in London. He said it was going to be in London. It was going to be on a Monday. 
and I worked out that Arsenal were playing Spurs the day before. <laughs> so I sent him a message saying, do you want to come? He said, I'm already coming. He said, we're going to London. And Paul and Gustav, half time, we were losing 2 0. But it, I don't know that other, other judges, have, they've got to get to know each other. The next generations have got to get to know each other. Whether yeah. you, some of it is personality, you know, just, you know, I'm a, I'm a sort of bloke who likes getting to know people. And if you're a bit lonelier, maybe not. But I, I mean, I hope it does continue. One thing that, that is just beginning to cause a bit of concern enough concern that bodies like IP Federation and the Intellectual Property Lawyers Association are, are now directly lobbying the government is that there, there seems to be the hint of a threat to our continued membership of the European Patent Convention. Now, it would seem like madness to go down that road, but there's certainly there, there is some some level of indication arising out of the document the, the EPC being missed off a reference in the draft um, treaty with the EU. You know, how, what do you think would be the implications for the UK IP professions if we, if we did drop out of the EPC? Well, the, the first question is what's going to happen to the patent office? I mean, it couldn't cope. We're not a big enough country to run a patent office properly. I mean, this idea that you can have a, a, a whole series of national patent offices is a huge burden. Yeah. Um, so at the, at the granting stage, things would turn into chaos. Um, from moving to what is a very brilliant patent office now, and has been for many years one of the best government departments. Uh, I did quite a lot of work with the government over the years, and I was Nigel Bridges' pupil, and then I was Treasury Junior myself for, for IP, and did a few other things for the government. And always the patent office was way better than things like the customs. Um, so um, we really have a, a profound, we'll become an isolation country and I don't think there's any good at all. It can do us a lot of harm. And I don't well, know, it may, it, the professions may lose out too because the status of the, of the UK uh, IP world will fall internationally. Well, of course, I mean, you know, while we've been members, you know, people might choose the UK as a means of putting down a marker around Europe because it's been such a reliable jurisdiction. Things are litigated thoroughly and you get a, a pretty reliable result. If we're not part of it, then people are only going to litigate here if the UK market is very important to them. And that's bound to be limiting, isn't it? You, yeah. You, yeah. yeah, quite obviously. So do, do you get much chance to talk to the, the students? Do you talk to them, any of them directly or only, you know, through the sessions you described in our last talk about, you know, the, sort of when you sit in on their I lecture? A bit of both. I mean, a bit of both. I, 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 I see them and I get nattering to them. Not, not, not all of them as a group, but, but somehow some individuals I get to know. Um, you know, this, you can't give all students you've got equal treatment they've got about 90 doing that i think this year doing ip undergraduate so what do you say to them about if they're contemplating a career in ip now do you think the opportunities will be as great for them as it as they have been for you and i over the over so many years i think so i mean i i, I don't see why not i mean it's it's ip is fractured now much more than it was so that there will be separate people who do copyright and separate people who do Trademark. One of the things I've learned is, is how important transactional law is. That they really, there are not two branches of uh, uh, there's not grant and enforcement. There are three. There's transactional law. And we have Mark Anderson runs a fantastic course. Um, you should be sending somebody from Galvings, maybe you do. We do, we do every year. Yeah, yeah. You may help me some of your people may be teaching on it. It's um, the profession to the profession. No, it's it, we value that course very much. I mean, it's a real, it's a, it's a big step it's forward. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yes, there's plenty of room for kids to go on in the future. The bar is still getting bigger. I mean, uh, how it'll cope at the moment with COVID and things. I'm 
hearing the patterns are holding up, but some of the smaller work is not holding up. There's plenty of work going on. There's plenty of court activity. I can tell you that. I know, I know that. Yeah. There's certainly a lot, a lot happening, and I must say that some of the some of the um, remote hearings have gone very well. Um, and sometimes it's less easy. It's going to be interesting to see how things evolve afterwards. Do you think there'll ever be even greater globalization of the IP world? Do you think it'll be beneficial? Do you think we'll ever have a, a global? It is difficult to say. I mean, really, it, it depends on greater globalization of everything. Um, you can't have globalization of patterns and nothing else. I mean, you've got to have, it's no good saying America first and then and, and expecting anybody else to do it. Or, but this is the way we do it. And either, either people do it that, the way we do it, and therefore they're okay, or they do it some other way and they must be wrong. So there is a big national tendency to happen everywhere. I mean, I mean you, you, how the Americans fell in love with the jury <clears throat> system is just unbelievable because they didn't do it when I was a kid. Uh, that, that was all, all dug up when they discovered if you went to a jury, um, the jury is up to find for the plaintiff, started in contract. It's an, it's an odd phenomenon. I've, been, I've sat through a number of US jury trials and it's a very strange, strange business. Hearing a, lot, a lot of them now think it's jolly good. A lot of judges think it's great. Yeah, I don't think it'll catch on here somehow. <laughs> I don't think it'll catch on here. <laughs> so one of my favourite quotes of yours over the years was you, you once said um, that the best place to hide a leaf was in a forest. And I've wondered, uh, the reason I bring that up now is because um, we're now beginning to cope with AI, uh, artificial intelligence. And I wonder if you think there may be a, a different approach to some areas of law where AI intervenes. And in, you know, looking at insufficiency, if an AI machine can scan millions of options in a few seconds, does it change the approach we, we might have to take, do you think? Yeah, might well. Um, uh, I mean, leave aside the, the, the sort of jurisprudential, can an AI machine make an invention? Which, yeah, well. Uh, um, and more difficult even is, of course, a AI and art, um, yeah. which brings you down to the question of what is art, and, all that sort of thing. Uh, and I, I don't want to go there. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I think any, any, any approaches in, in copyright law which do go that direction end up with that sort of thing. And like this idea of the, the, the author's own intellectual creation, I don't know what the hell that means. An extension of the author's personality, I just don't know what it means. I mean, if somebody made this thing, that's it, that's it. A lot of work, you shouldn't be copying. <laughs> yeah, well, quite, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, uh, 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 but put all that on one side, uh, as far as the patterns are concerned, the standards of obviousness may change. If you can try a million compounds at, um, with AI um, and, and see whether they work or not, well then, finding one of those may be finding relief in the forest. And it may be obvious, and that may have a, that may have a, a profound implications because, as you're going to read in my article on plausibility, one of the functions of the patent system is not to disclose an, a, a, an invention all fit and ready to go. It's to give you an incentive to research your idea. Yes. Check it, and that's that's one of the really that's one of the fundamental mistakes that is made by this theory of it's all got to be plausible. Well, indeed, yes. I mean, you know, there aren't many patents which are really reflect a kind of eureka moment, are they? Most yeah, they of them are the result of long hours in by men in white coats in labs. Yeah, it's, it, it's the beginning of the process, not the end of it. Yeah, and I mean, it, it seems impossible to think that AI won't infect that. So you think that the bar for inventiveness might shift up a bit? Yeah. And that may may not matter. But it may be a good thing. It may be, well. I mean, it depends how much development work you've got. To do. If you can do a lot of your development work by doing AI with a computer in no time, then we don't need an incentive for it. So we don't need a patent. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, that's another another. You know, now we're getting into the, the realms of the rather philosophical discussion about AI and patents. Are we really? You know, is it is it the reward for? for actual inventiveness or is it the reward for long for substantial financial investment um and probably a little bit of both somewhere down the line 
it is a bit of both, but is it, I think mainly it's the latter, actually. Very few inventions you, 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 you can practice by reading the patent. Tin opener, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, I certainly find that. I, mean, I think patents seem to get more and more obscure. I remember one I was reading very happily a year, a few years ago, and then I turned a page and there was just a page of formulae. And I thought, oh, God. <laughs> Right, I give up. Time for an expert. Sure Anthony Walton told me that when I was a pupil. He said there were some cases you just can't understand. He said there was a, there were some cases <laughs> in the nineteenth century. I said okay. he said you just you try and understand the technology. It was all expressed in nineteenth century language, and you couldn't. I love I love some of those very old old cases. They um, they make fascinating reading. Don't they? The yeah. way that judge written in those days. So. Coming to a close then, uh, Robin, do you, do you have a sort of message for the IP world today? Do you think it's in good shape? Are there anything, is there anything you would think it should do or shouldn't do to, to keep relevant? Well, I think the, the, the area probably of most concern is, is pharmaceutical. Under constant pressure, please, you know, you make, all these drug companies are wicked, evil machines. Until suddenly COVID comes and how are we going to get out of it and buy a big drug company because nobody else can do it. And if they'd be not about by the, the, the way that, 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 that the anti patent brigade would have wanted, we wouldn't have a machinery at, at all. Unless you can find some other way of doing it. And unfortunately, there isn't one. Governments don't spend money. Prizes are nonsense. Um, uh, uh, that Labour Party document which was absolutely ludicrous. I'm afraid it's part of my university that have suggested. Some of that stuff, but not not the law department, and they never they've never come and talked to me at all. I've invited them several times. That doesn't make a lot of sense. No, it doesn't. It doesn't work. It's just not human. It's not the way human nature works. And governments have, will not spend the money. They don't spend the money now. Why are they going to start now? So you think that 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 you know basically business generally that we, we should be be more respectful of. Big Pharma, for example, who uh, we, we um, explain the, how the patent system works. The, the big, the, the thing that the, the most difficult thing is it's counterintuitive that a legal right to stop people doing things increases the number of the rate of innovation and investment. It's counterintuitive. Jeremy Bentham said it, and in, 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 his brother had a had a, a patent. His brother produced one of the first industrial factories, the, the block making machinery for pulley blocks for the Navy. Right. So mine had 2,000 pulley blocks and they needed to replace it all the time. It's good business. But you had to make them. So Jeremy Bredden's brother helped bring the Battle of Trafalgar. And he understood patterns. And and Jeremy got it, did he? <laughs> he, said, uh, he said, if you don't get it, you'll be against them. If you do get it, you'll be for them. <laughs> that's what he said. Well, that's, that, is, <laughs> that is quite often. Actually, uh, that makes me think of one of your, another one of your uh, quotes. I remember in, um, you, you, you asked about, um, you, you were talking about, I think it was in, in um, the sort of Unilin chain of cases, and you said businessmen want certainty. Yeah. And um, I was appealing you, um, and we went to the, the, the great Sydney Kentridge to seek leave to go to the, the yeah. Supreme Court. You got me knocked and, um, I, quoted, uh, I quoted you to him on that, and he went, yes, in my experience, in any given case, 50% of the businessmen want certainty, which I <laughs> thought was an, an interesting report. I, 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 I mean, I, I wasn't talking about cases. I, was I know. About, I was talking about out there in, in the real world without without cases. Oh no, we I think we all, we all knew what you meant, and and yeah. that it was right. But it was quite a. He yeah. was a very good was, I mean, he, he, he saw what the, he saw the best point in that case. It was the only point, and that's that. And I got knocked over. <laughs> he was um, well, I mean, I, I think still is a great man. He was it was a, yeah. a high spot in my career to shake hands with someone who shook hands with Nelson Mandela. <laughs> There we are. Um, well, look, I had a friend who knew, knew Nelson Mandela. He was a chap called Sill. He's dead now. He, he, and he went out um, when Nelson Mandela became president. There was some event in, in the courts. And Sill was with him at the treason trial. And Mandela said to Sill, the last time I came here, 
I didn't know whether I was going to be taken out and hung. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a line. <laughs> well, look, Robin, thank you so much for taking so much time out of your, your busy life. You said at the, right at the outset of the first session just how much you're doing these days. So it's great for you to take these, the time to do these two sessions. It's been fascinating talking with you. I hope our audience are equally engaged. Please do continue to, to benefit the IP world with your views on all topics. I'll look forward to your paper on plausibility. We've all still got a lot to learn from you. And it's never short of entertaining. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Robin. Thank you. Been good fun. Good talking to you. Thanks. Bye.